Hello and welcome to Crucible Radio. It's me, Bones. Hey everyone, it's the podcast for all things Destiny 2 PvP. Uh, but as you know, if you listened to last week, you won't get that much PvP talk today. We're doing our solo episodes, little solo bolos, where the three of us each take a week and share with you, the listeners, uh, something that we care about. Hopefully, hopefully I care about this. Absolutely, of course I do. Uh, this week, it's just me. Um, and you know what? My voice is a little scratchy, so I'm not going to ramble for too long. I'm not going to give Andrew too much work. Uh, instead, I'm going to share a, a creation of mine, a podcast of mine uh, that's already been completed, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, hi. Hi. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, Swain said it last week. You know, he's already done this and I don't want to just copy him and, uh, you know, <laughs> I can't match Swain when it comes to actual uh, self-motivation and stuff like that, too. He's on a real roll right now, honestly, I'm, and I'm proud of him as a friend for for everything he's been doing and considering what's on his plate. Uh, he's a busy guy. It's pretty exceptional. Um, and plus I also, uh, I don't think I'm the most inspiring person. I don't personally believe in a lot of, uh, stereotypically inspirational stuff, <laughs> I guess. Uh, cause I'm, I'm probably, uh, a jaded pessimist at this point. Uh, that's for sure. But, you know, I I like to think that, you know, there's people that listen to this show. They hop in for the Destiny stuff if they're playing Destiny. Maybe they don't really listen to all the episodes. Maybe they've never heard any of them and they just tune in when there's like a big patch or like a Bungie interview. And to that person, hey, cool. Thank you for stopping by. Hello. Thank you for giving us a view on YouTube or a, a listen on the on the RSS feed. Uh, we We do appreciate that. Uh, but then there's also people that have been listening this whole time. I can't believe this. This is episode 192, 191. That's crazy. That's really nuts. Uh, I've done podcasts before, but never this long. I don't know why that was phrased like a joke because it was just a true statement. That's absurd, though. And um, to all those people, like, it's been awesome. It's been fun. It's been fun uh, being a part of something with all of you. Um regulars consistent since episode one uh, there's a few a few people that's listened to everything some people just like you know hop in and uh come back and you don't don't hit every week and that's fine i don't blame you uh regardless though it's been it's been really crazy and i would like to think that over that period of time you know 191 weeks and i've been on the show for probably 187 of those, I think, uh, counting all the episodes I've ever missed. That's a lot. That's a lot of me talking. And it's a lot of Swain talking. And it's a lot of birds talking. Am I right? Like way more. <laughs> gotcha. Zing. Um, but what I'm saying is that I'd like to think that the people who listen to the show have gotten to know us as people. And while... I say we do a pretty damn fine job of staying on topic, talking about destiny and specifically the PVP. Uh, you know, par- our personalities come out, uh, our friendships display that, and occasionally we take a few minutes at the top of the show or something like that to talk about something from our lives or what we care about. Uh, and I'm and I'm happy to share that with people, and I think that's you know part of the why it's uh, for us lasted so long. You know, like we share something with each other every week. And that's really cool. Uh, But the other side of that is that, you know, I've been observing the destiny community in the video game world from a, from not afar (laughs) from pretty up close for all of those weeks uh, more intensely than I ever did prior to starting crucible radio. And while I've witnessed truly incredible, uh, so surely incredible feats of humanity coming together to do something good, you know, see any awesome entertaining tournament from back in the day, like crazy hype moments or the fundraising that's, that's happened through guardian con. I mean, I've witnessed some beautiful things. Um, just ever, or just everyday moments of people inviting someone to a raid and making a new friend, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, I've seen that all the time. But there's there's plenty of other bad stuff. And I, you know, I don't really need you don't need me to tell you that gaming has its dark side uh, online. 
Uh, but yeah, so this is going to turn into a little self promo thing, of course. Uh, what did you expect from me? But yeah, when 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 Destiny Two is not the place to talk about those things, and our and our platform is about a video game, which I understand more than anyone. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of tough. Like I want to talk about those things, and I feel like if people have gotten to know me over the years, listening to the show or just following me online or interacting with me. Um, on discord or interacting with any of the three of us, it's that, you know, I care about some of those things and I want to make, I want to make it better. And if I have a platform to do it, even if it's a little tiny platform, I'll, I'll use it for good. At least I'm like a chaotic good. I think probably. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I would say I'm chaotic good because I can definitely just, uh, start arguments to start arguments or just, you know, <laughs> make too many jokes about something or whatever, but you know, for a good cause. And, uh, I'm sarcastic about things because I see the world doing insane stuff and I'm like, yeah, that's nuts. Uh, the only way for me to cope with it is to be uh goofy or sarcastic and funny, but chaotic good. So that's, that's in the good category. Uh, what am I rambling about? I'm talking about, <sighs> the destiny world, the gaming world, the video game world, the YouTube world, uh, I guess the podcast world, which is a separate thing. Comedy world. It's just something I'm passionate about outside of the, the internet. And it can be frustrating at times. It can be frustrating. Uh, even when it comes down to stuff I care about destiny, for example, when people are, uh, harsh to each other or to others, about it. You know, I'm not talking about like harsh, harsh criticisms of the mechanics of the game. I'm talking about harsh, mean, disgusting things said to other human beings because of the feelings we have about a video game. Uh, You know, that bothers me because I care about that thing and I care about the people who make it and involved with it or and play it. I care about the people that play this game. Uh, And then outside of it, you know, there's stuff that doesn't affect me, but the gaming world has problems uh, with a lot of people or, and treating others with respect, it's kind of shocking. I was literally in a, uh, the Nintendo direct stream. I watched that online today as uh when, when is this recorded Wednesday? Um, and it's like, you're just watching a stream with like 600,000 people watching it. And there's people in the chat, like, just like spewing hateful nonsense, like really like casually, not even super like super, super dark, hateful, just like, uh, looks like trash. And I'm like, what? Like, who cares if a new game comes out and I don't like it? I just don't like it. I just don't play it. Right. Uh, (laughs) it's wild that people spend their time. And I feel like people, uh, do have, have developed the, this idea that the culture of talking about things online is to hate them. And, uh, that's not fun really. You know, Hate truly bad things. Don't hate stuff that you just happen to uh, not enjoy as much as someone else. That's wild to me. Uh, So I've witnessed a lot of that. And it's something that bugs me because I feel like it's perpetuated by a whole bunch of stuff that so much just encourages it. So much about the internet world, the chaos of content creation, of opinionated YouTube videos or uh, Twitter posts and stuff, you know, the sort of like, what is it called? Um, controversy breeds interaction, right? So if you've got like a spicy hot take, you're going to get clicks, uh, you know, and that, and that could be totally performative, right? There could be people that just don't really care, but they know that if they're the bad guy on the internet, they'll have like great success. I mean, we know that to be true for some, in some cases. And I, and I just hate that it gets so frothed up. People get so worked up, but it's just like, well, yeah, because so much of the content and stuff flashed in front of your face while you're looking at your monitor is just like way too intense and mean or just like off base. And uh, and that's tough. So while I've been really proud of what we've made on this show and the two friends I've made making it and the many, many friends I've I've had outside of the show or helping with the show uh, seem to get it. I know a lot of people seem to get it. Uh, I, sometimes it drives me nuts, man. And I don't get to talk about that on an, on a regular episode. You know, I said like inspirational things 
don't inspire me. And that's definitely just been uh, true for a very long time for me, long before I got jaded about uh, the internet or anything like that. Like I remember in middle school, the trend, when there was a, like, I guess Facebook was really blowing up and they started adding little additions and there, you know, those little, like, I don't know what they called them, like stickers. And they all had these quotes. So there was like the first time everyone was just sharing repetitive, uh, you know, like images on the internet, right? Like it was just, you could see a billion things just hanging out on Facebook for 30 minutes. And a lot of it was like bad jokes. And a lot of it was just like inspirational stuff or just like, you know, positive little quips. And I'm always like, how do people feel anything from that? And some people do, and I just don't get it. So it's not really me saying it's impossible or it shouldn't be shouldn't be done. But literally, I cannot post a picture of, of my of a of a quote on Twitter and think like, yes, I feel better now that that's been said. Or I can't just post a tweet and say like, hey, everyone, you're great. Like I just I get nothing from that. I don't feel like it's sincere. So yeah, I'm not an I'm not a very inspired person, and uh, or or can't get inspired. And for that reason, I don't feel like I. Uh, can be inspiring in the, in the traditional sense. But what I think I can be is a semi-persuasive arguer. And I can be, I think I'm good at pointing out absurdities. You know, if that could be a skill, that's the chaotic good in me. Like, Hey, this is bad. Let me point out the craziness of it or just sit in that and, and really like try to bring that to people's attention. Uh, you know, and it doesn't always succeed, but I think I can see it in the things. For example, the raids in, in destiny Two. this, this raid race, people are sitting in front of their monitors for 24 hours. Like, I don't think that was a good thing. I think it's exciting that there's this big global event and we get to celebrate a hero who defeats Riven first uh, the first in the world i think a world's first competition is certainly a cool idea uh but boy that thing was so hyped up so glorified and it resulted in something that i think is unsafe and i think we all know is not good and and you know no one i'm not saying anyone planned it to be a 24 hour thing but the the video game world has moved away from mega 24 hour streams for a very specific reason uh and, and it is it is The reason is that it is not safe for you. So while there was just this like insanity about that, this hype about that, like watching it and like, who's going to finish? And I'm just, I woke up the next day and it was still going. And I'm like, this, this isn't good. (laughs) You know, we can't do this to ourselves. We can't do this to other people. Um, We do not have 24 hour basketball games where, uh, basketball players can seriously uh, hurt themselves for our sick enjoyment because we don't live in gladiator times anymore. But I don't know. I saw the absurdity of that. And it just, it's though that stuff sticks out to me now, if that makes sense. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about the internet and I do so on a different podcast called gaming in hell with my friend, Dan. And we'll just hit on the news. We'll hit on internet things uh, that we that we find ridiculous. And uh, you know, like we're, we're not. It's not. It's not about proselytizing too hard. It's just to say, like, wow, it's all so crazy. It's all so insane. Uh, why and why is it all so negative? I mean, why does everyone say toxic now? Right? Like that used to mean something, and now it's a it's the new meme word. Everyone has like a toxic emote on Twitch and people just say toxic in casual conversations for reasons I don't understand anymore. Remember when everyone used to say rip the dream, how annoying that was. Uh, But like, what does that mean? Like, are we just accepting that toxicity is like a chill, cool thing? And like, you know, the people who are accused of it embrace it and they think like, ah, yeah, that's my stick. Remember how I said you can be uh, the villain on the internet and get more attention. Uh, why do we, why is that happening? Why is it such a, such a popular word? It didn't come from nowhere. Uh, on this other podcast as well, recently, we had a really great conversation with uh, Mr. Birds. So yeah, you're going to hear your, uh, your other favorite host of Crucible Radio on this episode. Sorry, Swain. Um, but you know, we, we talked about something that I think isn't super, you know, uh, 
internet e isn't super gamer related, but is this just plain old reality of being a person that that you have to deal with? And and it just so happens that a lot of these thoughts and conversations uh, do happen on the internet. So, you know, I care about all these stuff and I, I these these bad things that happen, or or I get frustrated by them, and I want to talk about them on a show and vent about them. Uh, but you know, like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like harsh reactions. So, so this conversation, it's about like, well, what happens when you like something that's kind of bad? All right. Like, Oh yeah. I, I feel like that rings true for everyone. Like, Oh yeah, no, I heard some real bad shit about this one thing, but, uh, I don't know. I still kind of dig the, the result of it. Right. Or like, Hey, this, this song is like good, but you know, the person who makes it like, Oh, I don't want to think about that too much. Uh, this, this show's really funny, but you know, the guy who makes it got arrested, like blah, blah, blah. That's tough. And I get it. It's a tough convo to have. And I think like a lot of the times we just like, don't wrestle with it ourselves because the second we start thinking of debating how we should act about it, it's like, Oh, too confusing. Uh, I'll just pretend I don't think about this. Um, and the alternative to ignoring it and the, and the other extreme, I guess, uh, is like the new thing of like, you know, everything's canceled, <laughs> like delete this forever uh, for life. It, this one bad thing happened. You're no longer allowed to even admit that you once liked it or that it existed at all. It's really tough to find the middle ground between absolute cancel culture and uh, total and complete ignorance towards real problems that affect other people besides yourselves. And, uh, you know, like it sounds crystal clear when you say it uh, out loud about something, something in the, in the abstract like that, but really tough when you actually pick something that you like, you know, your, your favorite streamer that uh, says some horrible things on the internet, your favorite uh, musician that has a really dark uh, personal life that, has now come to light your favorite comedian that turns out to be awful. Not even the worst, right? Like just, Oh, they had a controversial moment in the news. I mean, even the most beloved people have that happen. Uh, do we cancel them and delete them forever? Do we say, Oh, everyone else on the internet is just like, you know, just being too sensitive about something. Like I think both are probably stupid except for the most extreme cases. Uh, but because not everything is the extreme case, it all falls in the middle. So birds comes on to talk with me and Dan about this topic. Uh, and it's something that I, it, and it's just one, it's one chunk of the stuff I care about the stuff that bothers me on the internet, the stuff that uh, I like on the internet, how it gets, how the stuff I like gets turned and twisted by things I don't. Uh, but I think this conversation is worth listening to and and my throat's already hurting. So I'm going to play you guys uh, the good long portion of that podcast. I deleted the part where we talk about eggnog for 15 minutes at the front because that did happen on that episode and it is not relevant to anyone else besides me and Dan who love eggnog. Uh, so I, I trimmed that. So this will jump in uh, uh, soon after our, uh, our eggnog discussion where we launch into this topic about uh, why your fave is problematic and what to do about it. And I hope that wherever this goes, that it shows you a little bit about stuff I care about and how I feel uh, outside of destiny. Right. And I hope that real soon again on this show, I can talk about how I feel about destiny uh, once more. Like I always do where I feel like we're at with the game, where I feel like I'm at with the game and like where I'm at getting better. I want to, I want to talk about some competition again and talk about the, the, the ever long grind to improve uh, because it's been a long one for me, four years of, I was just thinking like, could I have hit legend in year one of destiny one? Probably hell no. Uh, but I have now. So I guess something's been working. So I want to, I want to talk about that and, uh, and how I've been improving or if I've not, I don't know. We'll get back to topics. We'll get back to topics. I don't know what birds has in store for you next week. I'm sure it'll be heavy and he'll probably make you like, you know, rethink everything about your life. I'm just asking you to think about uh, 
<laughs> do you want to like continue worshiping the people you worship or should we, uh, you know, have forgiveness in our hearts and how do we decide when to, when to apply either? That's all I, that's all I want you to think about. And Swain wants you to think about being financially independent. Save your money, folks. Um, for once again, for real, Swain is very good at keeping his shit together. And I need to take some notes because I don't have it together like he does. And last week's episode was great. And because, and that, and it was great for me because I've been talking to him and I know uh, how it's all been going and where he's come from with that and, uh, and his journey on that, on that, that goal, uh, journey on that goal. <sighs> all right. I'm, I'm done. Thank you for listening. Check out Patreon where you get a little more of the, the side of us that doesn't come through in destiny talk where we talk about everything else. It's our bonus podcast. It's a buck an episode and it's really fun. Uh, we talked about, uh, apex <laughs> this month. That's dropping very, very soon. If not already on Patreon, because Holy shit, that game's good. Otherwise I'm done. I'm going to send you off to this wonderful episode of gaming in hell featuring me, my co-host Dan and our very special guest, famous birds, uh, to talk about some important things. Please enjoy. Thank you for listening. I'll be back in two weeks unless Birds wants me to do something on his episode. Probably not, though. He probably doesn't need my input. He's probably got it covered. Okay, bye. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. This kind of thing happens all of the time. Just cheer up, ignore it, and try not to dwell on that you're gaming, you're gaming, you're gaming in hell. Good, good start. Triple sevens across the board. Um, we're going to talk this week about a, a topic I've been really excited for since birds first mentioned it, but basically the concept of uh, your favorite things being a little problematic. And I don't want to, I don't want to get into it too detailed before birds really let's go. But this is, this is like so perfect for this show, even if we don't hit video games today. So let's dive into it. Shall we? Oh man. Oh, I'm in a weird noggy place, guys. <laughs> yeah, we got you real oh. messed up on nog oh. right before this. Yeah, I'm getting real <laughs> contemplative. I'm questioning my previous decisions, like drinking that eggnog a couple minutes ago. Your stomach feels all sloshy and full. Yeah, I just like, I just have drank a lot more eggs than I normally drink. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever, if you've ever wanted or, you know, we're unsure if you were uh, lactose intolerant. Uh, eggnog is like a perfect you test. Will there you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, no, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. And um, I've been thinking about talking about this for a long time because it's something that I've thought a lot about. And it's it's just not something where there's I, I really think we know quite how we're going to deal with it yet. Like, mm -hmm. And I think this is the right place to talk about it because I think your listeners are you know, you've got a pretty cool audience in that I think your listeners have in common that they're generally people who have made a commitment to learn about the world and, um, mm -hmm. you know, learn about things they don't know, learn about other people's experiences and points of view, learn about injustice in the world and try and take, you know, take that in, take it in, understand it, learn more about it and try and live like, you know, that and try and, act accordingly. And, you know, hopefully you know, we'll try and be better people. And it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to learn out there. And sometimes it's super straightforward, right? Like, like fuck, like Nazis exist. Like, Oh, Nazis are back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I thought, I thought we were done with the Nazis, but no, they're back, but all right, easy, right? Fuck Nazis. It's, it's not, it's not a real complicated stance to take. And then there's other stuff where it's like, like, you guys like a month ago or whatever, where there was um, that video game company that where like employees were, were you know expected to work like eighty plus hour work weeks, mm -hmm. and that's like the kind of thing where like that's more complicated, right? It's not just like fuck Rockstar. I mean, it's 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 a, a complicated issue. Like it it comes down to weirdness in the video game industry and about the expectations on workers there and weirdness in the pricing model and gamers being, being very particular about what they're willing to pay for a video game and how they play it. Like I agree it's shitty, right? Like 
a situation where people are expected to work hundred hour weeks. And if not, you know, not like they're getting paid overtime and if they don't participate, they're, you know, passed over for promotions like that's shitty, but I don't know what the fix is there, but like somebody does. And once you've learned that, like the right thing to do is to, when somebody tries to fix that problem to support them, which might be like, okay, games can't be made to people's modern expectations for $60 anymore without microtransactions. So it's like games cost 80 bucks now. And like, maybe that's it. Like maybe that's what mm-hmm. it takes with, um, with the support of making sure employees are able to lead reasonable lives while working in a video game company. Like y- you can take that in. It's, it's not a difficult thing to say that's a problem and we should try and do better. Where it gets tricky is when you have, skin in the game right like where it's a personal thing it's not just like oh yeah that thing over there that that sucks that sucks they suck i hate that like (laughs) and so like i look at i mean there's just like the obvious stuff where it's like oh i guess i'm the bad guy in this situation and that's tough because you know we tend to think of ourselves as the heroes or the victims and rarely as like the bad guy in the story but just I mean, I just like look at what I've learned over the last decade and, you know, the people I've become close with and looking back just over my life and seeing situations where I was like, oh, yeah, I I acted in an extremely shitty way. I was a shitty person there. (laughs) Or, um, I mean, like specifically like where, you know, I'm I haven't. I haven't assaulted anyone. I haven't raped anyone, but there've been situations where it's like, Oh yeah, I was in a position where I pressured somebody into doing something they didn't want to do. And I did not realize the extent of what I was doing at the time. Not that that makes it okay, but just that like, Oh, I can see it now. I I was too defensive or I didn't think it was an issue before, but I can see it now. And like, it's not easy to come to that realization, but it's still pretty straightforward, right? Like, okay, you, you take inventory, you own up to your side of it. You try and put yourself in the other person's shoes. If you did something wrong, you apologize for it. You make amends as best you can and you try and lead your life in a different way. So you don't do it again. And like, it's not easy, but it's still pretty straightforward. But then there's this middle ground of like, I didn't do anything wrong, but what happens when I like something that's shitty and like, maybe, (laughs) Maybe it's something that just didn't age well. Maybe it's something that is fine, but we found out the person behind it is a shitty person. And I, I've not, I've, I've read a lot about this. I have not found anyone who kind of put out a framework on like, for people who care about doing the right thing, what's the right thing to do in that situation? Cause you can't just say like, you know, you have the art and you have the artist and they're totally separate because, you know, if there's an awful person out there and you're paying their bills for them by buying all the stuff they make, like, y- y- you have an obligation to look at that. You have to understand. You can't do nothing. But at the same time, you can't say, oh, well, this person has done a bad thing, you know, write them out of the history books. Like, it's 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 never that simple. And But there's – I've really struggled to kind of find the tools to figure out how do you make sense of it? How do you – tell when something is iffy and when something is bad and when something is horrendous and what are you supposed to do in response to it? And so I want to talk about Louis CK. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there, the the list of things that could fall into that category where it's like, Oh, I know something about this thing and I just want to put it out of my mind a little bit so I can enjoy this one other thing that they do. Uh, It's a long list and it's probably because I don't know anyone who like many people in creative situations or, uh, or, or successful situations end up doing something shitty. Odds are kind of high, but it's also just like a natural part of life. Like your odds of encountering something, music, art, TV show of some, of someone who (laughs) is questionable, is just very high because other humans propel those awful people to great heights many times. Well, and it's so weird and it's, it's such uncharted territory too. Like, like we're in this kind of great awakening or whatever, like as a society where everyone's realizing how shitty either our behavior is or other people's past behavior is and uh, what's bad and what's, what's acceptable is changing. Um, it's not what it used to be. So I'm 
you know, I could spend my whole life watching Quentin Tarantino movies and thinking they're great. And then, you know, at age 31, have someone tell me that they think Quentin Tarantino's a racist. And you're like, you might be right. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly some questionable uh, <laughs> language in some of his films uh, that maybe he, you know, uh, was probably not best suited to uh, deliver. So it's 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 weird. And I don't know if there is a there's no perfect way of of dealing with it and understanding it and moving on. Um, like you said, without like just writing them out of the history books, which is interesting because it's like I I still love Pulp Fiction. Like, even mm-hmm. though I know that there's problematic parts of that movie, I still love Pulp Fiction. It's a great movie. Um so where do you go from there? I mean, I think in in general, like people's responses tend to fall into one of two categories. Let's say one of three categories. The first category is somebody says, oh, you know, this person kind of sucks, right? And the response is like, oh, the PC police I can't do nothing anymore. Like, okay, so there's that. Like, <laughs> right. we'll rule that out, right? I don't, I don't think that's this audience. And then there's like – people who don't like that thing and they get to say like, yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck their things. Fuck people who support this such and such. And it's like that, that that's not unfair, but like that's the other one. Or there's the one where it's, it's your thing. It's that thing that you like. And then it's like, well, you know, like a lot of people overlook, but I, you know, I, I don't, I think, but yeah, like you shy away (laughs) from it, right? You don't dig into it. And I think Mm -hmm. in trying to figure out, um, figure out a good way to act like a good way to be able to sleep at night, knowing that you're not perpetuating something bad, but you're also not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If, if, you know, there's a chance that's what the case is, you have to really dig into it and you have to own it. You can't put your blinders on. And so here's the thing with Louis CK is that Louis CK was, um, I think for me, like looking back over his career, his career had a big effect on me. Um, I mean, like growing up, I always loved stand up. I saw my first stand up show when I was like 12 and saw my dad took me to see Mark Maron and Mitch Hedberg at the Paramount, which like I still can't believe. Like, wow. yeah, I fucking looked out That's on that amazing. one. Thanks, dad. <laughs> um, yeah. But like for me, like like the first MP3 I ever downloaded was Chris Rock's Bigger and Blacker. And like I listened to that a hundred times easily. And then when Louis CK came along, you know, I was a little bit older. I was, you know, in college at that point, but he, he hooked into something because, and it like, look, you know, stand up in general or any one particular stand up, like you know, people have different tastes, right? I like, it doesn't necessarily mean it's for you and that's fine. Um, but there's something about stand up that I really appreciate because it's about having a way to, breakthrough boundaries and th- those can be all kinds of boundaries, right? They can be boundaries of representation. Like how many, how many white people learned about black culture through Richard Pryor and Chris Rock, like a- about having a, v- a voice that has no other place to exist, be able to break through. Um, it can be about um, breaking through gender stereotypes or um, relationship taboos. And I think if there's like a through line to Louis CK's art, it's about, um, about not being afraid to talk about like the basic human stuff we all share, but don't talk about. And so like his comedy is super blue and just kind of like his stand up is just gross. And it's like, that's fine. Like I, you know, y- you like it or you don't. And I think the quality is certain, certainly varied over the years. Um, but I mean, he proved what standups prove, which is that you are allowed to cross those boundaries and you're allowed to open up the conversation if you do it in a way that's really funny. If you're not funny and you go on stage with that shit, fuck you, right? You better, you better bring it properly, but you can see it in his TV show too. Like I think, uh, his first show, uh, Lucky Louie, um, changed like tried, like said, like, let's make a traditional family sitcom about, you know, uh, some, some parents raising a kid, but that doesn't filter out all of the real gross, um, practical parts of what that experience is of parents, 
um, hiding shit from their kids, of negotiating sex, of not liking their kids and putting that into the same format and say, this is just as important and just as funny and just as entertaining. Like, why can't we talk about this stuff? So it got canned after a season. You look at Louis and it's, I think, like in a lot of ways, kind of raise the bar for comedy needing to be funny in prestige television. Uh, you look at Horace and Pete, um, which nobody has ever heard of, but like, was a it was like a TV show shot like a a a, a stage production um, set in a bar about an extremely fucked up family that kind of goes to bits. Um, and you look in and you look specifically at this in the light of the sort of financial side of what Louis did was that he cut out a lot of industry bullshit like stand up in the eighties and nineties was a machine like any other. And he proved that it was possible to bypass that, that you can just record your album yourself. You can produce it yourself. You can sell it on your website for $5 without having an email list that spams people once a week or anything like that. And you can make a living off of that. And I like, there's value in that, right? Like that's just, just in terms of art, even if it's not for you, when I when I heard it for the first time, and I didn't know the rest of the story about Louis C.K., it had an effect on me, and I think I, I was richer for having appreciated it. And I don't think that I can forget that, right? Like, I don't think when I see other comedians who are self-producing and self-publishing, a huge part of what we do in the podcast world and the way people have been independently successful in podcasts, a lot of what Patreon does with stuff that was like it or not, I, I believe, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, Louis C.K. kind of proved that concept on a large scale. I mean, that's that's cool and that's important. And then you find out that he's a fucking sexual assaulter. He's fucking gross and like... And I feel embarrassed that it's like, I feel like this is like a guilty pleasure, not that it's, you know, you know, like, oh, I like Bruno Mars. It's a guilty pleasure. And I do like Bruno Mars and it is a guilty pleasure, but it's like, no, I like this person's work and this person is deeply unlikable now. And I'm in this position of trying to like, I don't want to defend him because fuck that guy. But at the same time, I got value out of his art and I don't think it should be eradicated. I don't know if I'd recommend it to people, but it's got its place in history. And so like, so, okay. So I, I think I can, I can say these are the good things I like out of it. This is, this is what it's given me and what it's brought to me. And then I think the next step is you got to reckon with what he did and not just go, well, there's the art and the artist. Like, no, it's everything Louis has ever made <laughs> has been his name in some way. Yeah. Right. And, and that was, I think, one of the shocking things to me is when we found out what he did, a lot of people go like, oh, well, like, okay. So, you know, Louis C.K., um, you know, after he was well established at the, in the, the hierarchy, the pantheon of um, people at the top of stand up. Um, repeatedly over the years invited uh, young female comedians um, into private rooms to his hotel room or whatever, nominally under the business or the, the concept of talking about business. And he'd whip out his dick and start jerking off in front of them. And hearing the apologists for that talk about like, oh, well, you know, they just could have left or it's not like you yeah. raped them or all that. Like, that that kind of thing, like I think you can't shy away from that. You can't you have to you have to think about it until it's not just this abstract hypothetical of, well, if I were in that situation, like you have to think through what it actually means to do that. So Bones, let me ask you a question. Okay. Let's say I had a party at my house, um, and not like a rager or anything. Um, but you know, get together, you know, we did plenty plenty of people. Um and um I invited Alex to a back room, told her I needed to talk to her about something. And when we were back there, I whipped my dick out and started jerking off in front of her. What would your response be? Uh, assuming I find out soon, I'd, I'd probably just beat you until it got to the point where like I'd go to jail yeah. <laughs> yeah. for, for like destroying. Exactly. Them. It would, it would destroy, it would destroy all of our lives. Like in an instant, yeah, it, it, right. it would it would destroy me, it, rightfully so. It would destroy Eugenie. It would destroy you. It would destroy Alex. It would destroy our friendship. 
it would destroy this podcast. It would, it would be a point in our lives that we would never bounce back from. And never consider, and like, and that's, that's like, oh, well, you know, some friends got drunk one night. Like if I, if Eugenie came home and said like, yeah, my boss called me into his office and started jerking off in front of me. Like, all right, I guess I'm going to jail. I'm I'm going to fucking kill him. Like you don't, when you think about it in that context where it's real, it's real people in your life, there's no question how, how utterly horrendous an act this is. I, I feel like, yeah, yeah. The, you just, you saying that, you know, like the, <laughs> the people you were imitating who I, who are definitely out there, like, well, it's not like he did anything to the, like that couldn't possibly be an excuse. Now when you, when you really put it on you, it's like, what? There's no world where you could sit back and go like, well, it wasn't that bad. I, 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 I have a sense that your audience is probably on the level with this. But I think that like that's the thing that those people are missing and that a lot of people – I mean, I go on every fucking podcast and just talk about Dunning-Kruger. But like when you're <laughs> sitting in an armchair and it's a hypothetical for you, when you've never experienced something like this in your life – or you don't know anyone that you know of who's experienced something like this. You you don't you don't quite realize what that situation is like. Like yes, people they could have stood up, straightened out their legs, and walked out of the room. But that's a response to an assault. That doesn't that doesn't negate the assault. It is mm-hmm. huge, and to see so disappointingly the non-apology that he made, like I acknowledge I have been inappropriate and the standard sort of chud response of, uh, I'm sorry to anyone who might have been offended by my actions. Like, no, you should be Mm -hmm. sorry because you assaulted somebody. Right. Yeah. Because you did it. And this idea that you're going to take six months off and then like sneak back into the cellar for a surprise set. Like I, I read some, some, some some analogy online that's like yeah if there was if there was a, a janitor at your at your company who had the bad problem of uh cornering people and jerking off in front of them and he disappeared for six months you wouldn't be like eh, hey, bring him back you know he was a great janitor he kept the floors clean we right just, you see him cleaning the halls one day and you're like well he is cleaning yeah. yep <laughs> so you know he made his amends i like just just that idea that like well you just gotta wait it out and blow over and it's like what what's louise he's just not supposed to do stand-up anymore when the reality is like if you were a cop who pulled people over and started jerking off in front of them, or if you were a McDonald's manager and asked employees to come back to your, the idea that you would make a return to your position after a certain amount of time, like, okay, maybe there's some conceivable timeline where you rebuild your life to uh, making amends for this and trying to change the world to ensure that it never happens again. Like, okay, maybe there's some public space where you're allowed to appear again, maybe, but no, no. I mean, like the, 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 the situations where you don't end up in jail are absurd. And right. Mm -hmm. So being a famous comedian is a privilege in itself. Right. And turns out you're a serial assaulter. You should lose privileges in life. Uh, it doesn't like there is no like certain amount of time where it's like you just get to go back to normal. Like there's no paying your dues. It's like get a real job if you need to. Yeah. And especially in the context of art and artistry and birds, you just mentioned like how much, you know, his comedy can have an effect on the co- comedy world or your uh, your own in- concept of comedy and all of that. I feel like it's so often that we just, you know, it's the whole, um, it's a very Hollywood approach to what being an artist means, which is that I was born to do this and it's all I could ever do. And a lot of actors say that, like I was, I could, there, I wouldn't have any other way to be a, I couldn't do a job if I wasn't acting. And it's like, you sure fucking could just like file some envelopes and stuff. <laughs> Anyone's capable of doing that. So when it comes down to it, Doing stand up for money is a job and you lose your job. Mm -hmm. Hey, and look, if Louis CK wants to stand on a street corner and tell jokes, I, 
you know, not, not, not knock yourself out, but <laughs> if he's going to go back on the road and start touring and record a new album, stand up and a lot of art is different, right? It's not like he works for the comedy company and they fired him right. and won't rehire them. He works directly like <laughs> to his credit, he helped build a he built a system for himself where he's not dependent on some corporation to um, to, you know, to give him airtime and to to send some of the profits back to him. That's the good part. But the other part is that that means the responsibility for deciding if he has a career is now on his audience, right? It is direct to them. And I think that part is pretty clear to me. This I feel pretty strongly about, which is uh, if Louis C.K. records another album – I am not going to buy it. Like not, not that there was any question, but I am not going to do anything that financially supports Louis CK. I'm not going to buy an album. If he has a new show on Netflix or whatever, I'm not streaming it. I'm not giving it the numbers. And it's not because I don't want to poison my brain with the thoughts of this terrible person. I'm, like, you know, his, his stand up has been declining over the years. I think he was recording albums too fast, but like, it's not about that. It's that I don't want to enable this. I don't want that janitor working back at the company. I don't want the manager getting another job where he can hurt people. I don't want Louis CK in comedy clubs. Um, after he, he, uh, hurt a bunch of people and, and lost that privilege. And so that, that I think is a is a the first decision you have to make, which is, do yeah. I financially support this thing I find objectionable or not? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's number one. It's kind of like uh, the easiest decision you can make is uh, when when you find out something is problematic is is to choose not to support it in the future. Um, obviously the, the kind of complicated thing comes with wrestling with the past in your own mind. It's yeah. like, well, you have to take stock of, of all the things that were going on and, and then kind of like your enjoyment of it and what that says about you. Um, but it, it is easy to say, you know, okay, I'm not going to support this in the future. Well, it's easy to say if you're, if you're kind of, like one of our listeners or like one of us, someone who is clearly thinking about this, not the people who are making excuses for uh, behavior that they deem, well, not as bad as rape or murder. So, yeah. Oh, I mean, and, and this is a judgment call like any others, like Louis CK is an easy one. There are other ones where it's like, Oh, yeah. this guy just sucks. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's like how many yeah. amazing musicians just like fucking suck and are shitty people, but make good music. And it's like, yeah, I, I, there's no one single horrendous thing that he did. And like, you, you have to, you have to make your judgment call. I mean, like maybe I'll, I'll download his shit from BitTorrent. <laughs> maybe I'll still appreciate it, but I don't want to financially support him. Or maybe I've thought it through and I think it's bad, but I don't think it's that bad or I don't think me buying this game is going is is an endorsement. Like you know, thinking about what was it, Red Dead Redemption, right? Like, do you support the company that did these shitty things? Like, it's complicated, right? Like, are you supporting <laughs> tough, the employees yeah. who are relying on you to buy this game to get paid? Do you do you are you endorsing them to do it all? Like, you 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 have to wrestle. It's with like. That. Uh, Hassan Minaj has a very good joke about that where he says like he never he's never going to fucking use Uber ever but he did travel to Vancouver and they don't have Lyft so <laughs> he's, he's not going to he's not going to walk <laughs> yeah um well so I I'm curious you know I we we sort of talked a little bit in advance about about that thing that we we liked or maybe we still like but is just like shitty and wrestling mm. with it I mean Louis CK is about as good an example for me as you can get. I mean, what are you guys wrestling with? I mean, okay, we record on Sundays, so it's kind of appropriate to mention this, but like I was thinking about this question in advance and like the first thing that popped into my head was the NFL. Mm -hmm. I watch the NFL almost every week and I play fantasy football and yet the NFL is such a terrible like 
organization <laughs> full of like uh, so many questionable decisions. And um, like, if you think about like all, all of these players are sure to have some form of brain damage from playing in the NFL every week. Uh, I mean, it's literally like dudes bashing their heads against each other. And uh, there's all sorts of um, like the very recent example was Kareem Hunt, the Chiefs running back who uh, there was a video released of him kicking a woman in a hotel uh, hallway. And um, the, this happened in February and apparently the NFL knew about it and he was allowed to play like as if nothing happened. And then TMZ obtained uh, the video here in December and released it. And that's when that's when the NFL decided to take action. Only once anybody knew about it. Um, so I, the NFL is just is just that like awful, mm. terrible organization. And, you know, I've. I've definitely scaled back. Like I used to buy like Vikings merchandise because they're my favorite team. And it's like, I don't, I don't really buy any NFL apparel or gear or, or support them in any kind of way. I'll watch the games on TV or, or with my dad's like NFL direct TV login. And it's like, well, he's, he's paying for it. Not me. So I'm not the bad guy here. <laughs> um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't feel very good about it ever. It is impressive how the NFL on like every moral or social issue, with some exceptions, but like almost as a rule, just consistently comes down on the wrong side. Absolutely. Like, yeah. On on all levels, the organizations themselves are bad. The overarching encompassing NFL itself is bad. Then there are players that are bad. Like there are abusers employed making millions. It's just on all levels, the NFL manages to be shitty uh, no matter which direction you look. Uh, They can't even change the name of their team. That's super racist. (laughs) Well, so I, I mean, I think as part of this, like it's easy to think about to find examples of just how shitty it is. But the reality is that you haven't forsworn the NFL. Like you get something out of it. Like, and, and, and the the good stuff you get out of it is good stuff that you get. I mean, like, I'm curious, just like for you personally, like what do you like about the NFL? What's, what's been good to you or what value have you gotten from it? I mean, like growing up, my, my, my family is from Minnesota. So um, you know, kind of lifelong Vikings fans in my family. So it's always been like a bonding thing between me and my dad is having, having the Vikings, having, you know, NFL to talk about. And you know, it's all playing fantasy football is fun. I'm pretty good at it. I, I have made a lot of money uh, off my friends over the years and that's always fun. Um, and it just kind of has that, that competitive, competitive element uh, between, you know, buds with like you know kind of low level trash talking and it's just kind Mm -hmm. of like a thing to do i like doing lots of research um and uh really digging in deep to like analytics and all this sorts of stuff that i like that feel like seems like it gives me some sort of competitive edge and then you know i get to apply it in some in whatever way i can um it kind of just ticks a lot of those boxes for, for my brain. Um, and then, and then like on a pure visceral level, it's just an exciting sport to watch for me. Um, I enjoy seeing long pass plays. I, my personal favorite like position, uh, and all time favorite player is uh, a wide receiver, Randy Moss, who, uh, had, you know, like, like he was like six foot four and he ran really fast and he always caught deep balls and he was just, you know, big play after big play. And, and that's always kind of informed like my, like that's kind of like how I think of the NFL. When I think of the NFL, I think of those long pass plays with Randy Moss when I was like 12. And, and so it's always just been kind of like me trying to, recapture that that feeling and a lot of times you know the nfl really does like have that like i said visceral and 
I, I can't think of a better word to describe it. I mean, the sport is obviously, you know, pretty violent at times. And it's like why people watch MMA. It's like why people watch boxing, you know? I mean, like, yeah. it's just seeing seeing that kind of action is exciting. And it's weird and carnal and bad, but still exciting and it's hard it's hard to it's hard to separate those two things sometimes for me bones what about you oh i could talk about the nfl a lot too but um one thing that came up that you know i think there's there's probably a, a long list for me and it, and i thought this would be interesting to mention because i don't it doesn't weigh that heavily on me so i think that's like maybe a, a possible distinction here we have to, we have to make is that there are some things I just won't do. Or, and I've said, Hey, fuck no, I'm done with that shit. And then there's some things where I'm like, I don't even feel that bad for doing it. And then one of that, one of those things is probably uh, rap music, the genre that I love and the many artists that I listen to. And you know what? I've made it very easy to just go like, yo, I love I love the bravado of this, of this music, the flows, the, the styles that change and develop, like who's doing what the energy of it. And then the artistry just of the actual rhymes and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, they're going to say like some of the grossest misogynistic stuff, but like, eh, it's kind of part of the character. And I've made it super easy on myself to just be like, of course I don't say that stuff and I don't, I don't ever repeat it. And maybe I say some things along in the car and then even some stuff I don't say in the car by myself. Maybe even I used to say every word in the car and now I don't anymore. Uh, but I've made it like, I just love it. I love all types of rap music and you know, there's variety of rap. It doesn't all have to be bad or gross or whatever. And in the past, maybe I've listened to some good rap in, in good. I mean, in like the Christian sense of the word, uh, cause I have listened to a lot of Christian rap, but now at this point, no, it's, it's what you'd expect out of it. It's the, the hottest artists right now, little top 40 stuff, and then a little more deep cut things. But I just, it's, it's just one of my favorite forms of music of all time. Yeah, we were talking about this, Eugenia and I were talking about it earlier, earlier today. And like she had pointed out, cause like we've been listening to a lot of, um, a lot of good rap music recently that is, um, just like good, weird stuff. Like, you know, you just like new Anderson Pac albums out like this. Great. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just mentioned like, you know, Chance the Rapper or just, um, you know, we've been listening to Tank and the Bangers and Tierra Whack and just like all of these, all of these things in the world of hip hop that just don't have that element. And I love them. But at the same time, I mean, I think the thing that I like about that other kind of rap music is the same thing that I get people liking about the NFL or <laughs> MMA, which is like, <laughs> there is something just like viscerally aggressive about it that is satisfying. And it's fucked up when like the subject matter becomes part of the form. Like it's not really that music unless it has that, or it's, it may, maybe it is, maybe there's a way, but it's when it's so tied up in that it's, it's tough to, <laughs> it's just not the same. It's just a different thing. Let me tell you, Christian rap is not the same thing. <sighs> <laughs> Stop forty rap. That, that is a it is, it is very different. The whole world. I don't know what, anything about <laughs> what. What are a few of the the top like Christian rappers out there? Oh, dude, I don't know if I would know now, but one when, of my all time favorite, favorite artists, favorite artists of all time, uh, was Toby Mac. Okay, and Toby Mac. It okay. was originally uh, one of the three members of DC Talk. Okay, I remember and, them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they had the song. <laughs> they they were famous for the song Jesus Freak. Mm. which if you lay it over smells like teen spirit is nearly identical <laughs> musically. And uh, there's this long trend of Christian music being like, Ooh, that thing's popular and mainstream. We should have a version of that. Uh, but he went on to do a lot, a lot of solo work. It's very pop rap. He had some real bangers and he had some more chill stuff and I don't know, but for the longest time, it was one of my uh, favorite things to listen to because 
he had that energy. Like he really does go all out on some of his old rock songs. And they are the, (laughs) one of them was used for like the commercial for like the transporter two or whatever. So think about that kind of music, you know, like this is the days of Limp Bizkit and all that, but it went really hard. It really rocked and he could like flow and it was, it felt good to hear. And so that's like where I got into it among with, like a a scattering of other smaller stuff. But eventually I think I just like, I don't know, middle school is when I started listening to other stuff and was like, okay, there's much more out there and it goes a little harder. But yeah, that stuff was, that was my jam back in the day. So I was talking about this uh, with my sister a while back. Um, My sister who is like just one of the like capital B best people I know. Um, and who is uh, a very moral person. Um, and she made, she made a couple points that I think hit me, which is like, the first is that like, look, we're not perfect and we're going to like stuff that has issues and we're all going to have guilty pleasures that we feel bad about. Uh, and that's okay. Right. Like being a good person is not about being perfectly pure uh, and never letting the bad thing enter your head. Cause that's just not, not what it's about, but she did give me a couple pieces of advice. Um, the first is that when you watch something that's made by a shitty person, you watch it in context, right? So like, mm-hmm. look, we all know Woody Allen is a pedophile <sighs> and yeah. that's, Like, what a shame, right? Because Woody Allen made a lot of important movies that informed a lot of other movies. He, the whole, like, nebbishy Jewish thing is something that, like, I'm glad I had that growing up as a kid. They're like, oh, I can identify with this. Um, And so I don't think the answer is, look, you can never watch a Woody Allen movie again. But I think you need to know who he was and... Uh, understand the movies when they got made and how they got made. And you need to, you need to consider the movie on that level too. Uh, And what's interesting is that like a lot of Louis shit doesn't really hold up when you realize like, Oh, you were, you were that guy. (laughs) You were, you were the bad guy. You actually (laughs) were the bad guy. And I think what that, like that has changed the way I appreciate it. Cause even when I try and put the other you know, art, not the artist thing aside, when I watch a lot of this stuff, it's like, oh, this was not insightful. This was confessional. Like that I can appreciate this now because I can appreciate seeing so clearly how a bad person operates. Um, so you, you, you have to take that. So you can't put your head in the sand. You have to understand the context of it. And if you want to watch the movie first and then, you know, figure out what was up with Woody Allen and then feel grossed out, you're welcome to. Um, the second thing was, was about the financial thing, right? When you give these people money, you are endorsing them. You are giving them the money yeah. to keep making these things and to pay their lawyer, lawyer's bills so they can not be punished for the things that they've done. And, um, you got to be real, real careful where you spend your money. Um, But the last thing, and this is an important one that I could spend an entire episode talking about because it was one of the best piece of advice I ever got, which is that part of the reason that Louis C.K. was such a breakout success is because he is a schlubby white male everyman that is incredibly supported and well accepted and uh, welcome in pop culture. But if what you like is funny stuff, if what you like is transgressive comedy that pushes up against norms to crack people's minds open, there is an enormous fucking world of people out there doing it right now in a way that's relevant and that is better mm. that you have not been given access to, or you don't have access to have been closed out of the system uh, because they transgressed in the same way that Louis did not like, like legally, but, but in terms of what they talk about, but they don't have that armor of um, being readily castable in a CBS sitcom. And so you should do the work. 
that if you are sad because you can't appreciate your guy's stuff anymore, go find new people. They are out there and it is easier to find them than ever. And there is so much good stuff going on that will crack your brain open. You should do the work to find the good stuff and to, to not just go with, well, you know, I like this when I was in high school and I still like it. So I'm going to stick with it. Like, no, there's so much out there. <laughs> you should do that. And you should give those people your money. You should prove that it's possible for people who don't fit that mode of mm-hmm. schlubby every man um, to, to show that there's, there's a place in pop culture for them and that they can carve out a career and they can be successful. Um, and that, you know, that, yeah, you might still listen to that album. You might still watch that show. Um, but when you support other people who need your support, um, for your own benefit, because you enjoy it, because you're finding new good stuff and sharing it with the world, that's, that has a real effect. And that mm-hmm. helps cancel out, um, the idea that in comedy, there's space for four people and two of them are rapists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, even on a even on a selfish level, just finding those new artists, those new musicians, those new comedians uh, feels good. It's a satisfying yeah. feeling when you when you feel like you've done all this digging and you you hit pay dirt. You know, like mm-hmm. it, it just feels good to have found something, and it's like, well, I've got this whole back catalog I can dig through. Um, it's uh, it's it's always worth the effort for sure. I mean, it, it used to be a lot of work, right? Like, yeah, I was going to oh, say yeah. before the internet, but honestly, like, even five years ago, 10 years ago, like, you, you had to look, you had to go looking and like find the blog or find the thing. And now it's like literally all you have to do is say, like, I'm going to take a chance on something else on Netflix. I'm going to log into the place I always log in and click a different box or I'm going to go on YouTube or I'm going to like how many podcasts are out mm-hmm. there where in 30 minutes they tell you all they find and tell you about all the cool stuff that like it is so accessible. What it really requires is a decision to say, um, I don't want to give my money to this person who sucks, but I do want to give my money to someone. Let me find someone who is is better, not a better person, but more deserving it because they're making things that I like and haven't jerked off in front of anyone. It is, it is funny that like one of the biggest things working against you doing that is the sense of like comfort of nostalgia. Are you talking and- about finding new stuff or jerking off in front of people? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, no, the sense of comfort and nostalgia. Um, Jesus Christ. No, the, the sense that you know, I listen to the same shit I listened to for the last 15 years. I love blink 182. Oh, it's my favorite yeah, band. Do. I don't wow. care. So it's like every fucking party my, you get this well, guy drunk and give him the iPod. Man. <laughs> oh boy. Oh yeah, boy. I, and I always put on, I miss you. It's totally a buzz. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, but it, you know, like literally all I'm doing is listening to the same artist I've listened to years ago. And what recently, which was funny that I just started doing this and we were about to do this show. He said, I just got real into going through all of the lonely islands discography again. And I love the lonely Island for me, honestly, <laughs> this is, this is good. Uh, birds, you, you were brought up on some of the greatest stand up artists of all time. I was brought up on the guys who did jizz in my pants, <laughs> but to me, like they are some of my favorite comedy of all time and really, really like, when I was growing up figuring out what was funny, like that was it. And yeah, they're like silly and beyond stupid, but all their songs are structured like sketches. They know how to heighten. They immaculately match the real music that they're parroting in the way that like not even weird Al does because it's weird Al's voice, you know, like they do the voices, they know the styles and like, I love it. And so it, it started by, I was listening to the soundtrack of to pop star, never stop, never stopping great movie, but that's lonely Island music through a character. Like the whole point of that movie is that he's playing this Justin Bieber parody, who is the peak of ignorance. This is the dumbest person alive. Who's been given millions of dollars is moderately good at music and then says whatever they want. So you're listening to these like very, very like, oof, wow. If anyone really did this, it'd be bad. But the point is this person is awful. And then I'm like, great. Now I got to listen to all the classics and I'm going back. (laughs) There is literally a comedy interlude bit on, I think their 
second album and it's called watch me do me. And the whole point is that it hypes up like, like that's how rap, you know, you do, you watch me do me. It's getting hype. And then the joke is it is a person making someone else watch them do themselves masturbate. And I was like, wow. Uh, Okay. Full circle. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I was like, Hmm, this aged very, very well. This aged perfectly almost. And I realized that some of the old stuff, uh, didn't have the, the performance of a character being intentionally stupid. It was just, that's a gross joke guys. So it was, it was kind of weird to realize like, Hmm, I really loved this in high school. I thought that was hilarious. Well, that's, that's a whole other category of things where it's like, you know, we didn't find out something horrendous about the person who made it. (laughs) It just didn't keep like, it just didn't, it didn't age well. And that I think is, is almost trickier to figure out because there's a lot of stuff that I grew up on and I loved uh, unabashedly at the time and was enriched by at the time. Um, but it just doesn't work in 2018. Yeah. And I have, I have some thoughts, but like, I was trying to think of examples for this. And honestly, like, I, I think it's harder for me to find, to think of examples of things that did hold up well, like really the Beatles. <laughs> yeah. The Beatles yeah. are a classic, but then it, God, he did beat up a lot of women. Fuck her. Yeah. Like, right. I, like I, I, I mean, one of the single most important pieces of culture in informing who I am as a person is the TV show Seinfeld, and it's the kind of thing where it's like I wish I could recommend it to people, and sometimes I do. But there's like the caveat of like, oh yeah, there's some iffy stuff in there, and it wasn't. Was it was it iffy in 1999? I mean, right. Y- y- you know, people were still people then. The same terrible shit was going on, but just the bar has moved. I, I mean, like, maybe maybe this is a guilty pleasure is a better way to describe this stuff. But yeah, I don't know. What do you guys got on your list? We might use guilty pleasure almost too liberally these days to imply like, oh, yeah, I love Carly Rae Jepsen. Yeah. <laughs> or just, <laughs> oh, you're not guilty at all. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the horrifying thought that everything older than three years is fucked up in some way we didn't realize at the time. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I just started uh, rewatching um, The Mighty Boosh, mm. the uh, British uh, comedy series. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me tell you, it does not hold up. It does not hold up at all. <laughs> um, like, I mean, they do blackface on multiple occasions Oof, yeah. and, and it's kind of like thinking like, like was that was not, a, that was probably not really even okay in 2006. Um, but I, I, I don't know. 2006 was like weirdly like this, like wild west of comedy. Like if you go back and watch stuff from the mid to late 2000s, like the, you know, like that 2005 to like 2012, there's some shockingly problematic stuff. And in, and in general, like I kind of grew up watching like lots of British comedy. So like the, uh, the original office, Ricky Gervais, he's terrible. We know that now. Uh, let's see. Uh, the IT crowd, Graham Linehan, the creator is oh, yeah. openly transphobic on Twitter now. And, like, yeah. Even and still like, and like, let's be clear. Like, not the, well, like, I don't, I just don't know, but just like a- actively fighting for the oppression of trans people. Just, yeah. Oof. Like kind of, it kind of to a shocking degree, right? Yeah. Like not, <laughs> not just like kind of ignorant or, uh, unsympathetic, but just, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so monstrous. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm starting a new thing. Cause I, I started watching the IT crowd in November. You've heard of, you've heard of no nut November, well, I'm starting No Nostalgia November. Hey! Oh, I like that. I like that. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I I will not. What are the rules here? I, I will not ever watch a thing that I've already seen every November because it will only lead to disappointment at least a quarter of the time, if not more. That's interesting. Well, and, and I, I know the way I work, which is that like I tend to get very into things and use them up forever and never come back to them with not a lot making it through the rotation. But yeah, the idea of spending one month looking for new things means I'm going to have 
I'm going to come out of it with things that I will obsess over for the next year. Like mm-hmm. I will be so sad right. for, for, for right. new ideas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, please remind me in a year from now, since it's December I, I know <laughs> my timing's not great. We should have done this episode <laughs> a month ago, but uh, it, it's an interesting idea. And I, I kind of, I kind of have been subconsciously uh, doing this approach to music. I haven't listened to my favorite band in I feel like five years, which is strange. They're my favorite band and I haven't listened to them in like five years. Like that's a, that's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, But I, I just, I don't, listen to a lot of the same old stuff that I grew up listening to, even though I still, if you, you know, put me on the spot would tell you that it's my favorite. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly looking for new music. So it's like, why don't I apply this to other things? Like, why don't I apply this to, you know, we play lots of video games, gaming, maybe don't play the same 14 strikes that I've played in destiny a billion times for the month of November or whatever, you know, like uh, it's, it's easy to do. Like when I think about all the things that I watch and, and things that I do, it's like, God, I, I really am a creature of habit. It would be interesting to, Mm. to kind of uh, stir the pot a little bit. No, I like that. I, um, I feel like I'm, I'm perpetually like I'm musically, I'm always just like driving around with the needle on empty just at all times. <laughs> like I've got three songs left that are not used up yet. So I gotta, I gotta measure them out. Um, so I was, I was talking about this topic, just about things that have aged poorly with Eugenie earlier. And she, and I brought up Seinfeld and um, she made a point that I think is really important, which is like stuff that's 10 years old is gonna feel like stuff that was 10 years old. Like it was a different time back then stuff that's 20 years old, stuff that's 30 years old, 40 years old. Like you, you just can't expect things to not reflect in a large way, the context that they were made in, but she gave a metric that really rang true for me, which is, is this idea of saying, okay, well, knowing what it was like at the time, how did they, what did they do that was groundbreaking at the time? Like how far in front of the norm did they get? And so like the example she gave was seeing the character of Elaine, who's a single sexually active woman who is not somebody's girlfriend, who is not a minor character written in the show as a plot device. I mean, granted, it is a show with one female character, which is unfortunate. (laughs) Yes, it's a show Mm -hmm. where they write in a new throwaway girlfriend for each of the main characters every week. But that idea that it was, yeah, we've got a show on NBC and we are going to show an actual adult woman who gives like zero to, to few fucks whatsoever was huge. It was something that was never seen before and that carved out a space that didn't exist previously. And that, that when you can apply that, that metric to old stuff, you can kind of suss out the difference between like, yeah, this song was good, but it was just as bad as everything else being made at the time and just doesn't hold up to like, yeah, there are issues with this because we just know more than we used to. Um, but when you give it a fair judgment, it is better than that thing that was just a product of its time. It, it did something new, it carved something new out and it laid the groundwork for us to keep, keep moving forward. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't make it perfect. It doesn't mean that I'm going to recommend like those old Woody Allen movies to anyone. Um, but it, it makes me, it gives me a framework to say, yeah, I'm not ashamed to like this thing. I see the problems in it, but I also see that it it did something worthwhile that does hold up. Um specifically because it bucked all the all the the fucked up things that were normal for the time and that anything we make today is going to seem impossibly terrible 10 years from now and that's just how it goes, so we just try and stay ahead of the curve. I love Midnight in Paris. Right? Such a good movie. That that's that's the best way to put it. Honestly, I didn't think you'd have such a good answer, but in the in the in the reality we just explained, where you can just simply find more things because there is so much out there. 
Seinfeld, great. Hugely influential, influential TV show. There are now literally hundreds of TV shows on at any time. It, it's the, the options are truly absurd comparatively. Um, but now you have that, that metric, like, look, how much do you need this? Think about it. What's it doing for you? What is it really doing for its genre or medium, right? Like, it, has it changed something? Is it changing something right now? Are you really getting, like, art out of this? Uh, or do you just uh, shamefully like it? Or are you being lazy and listening to the same thing you listen to day in, day out, uh, which I tend to do? And and just having a little bit more like, oh, okay, it's just a question of being a little more adventurous and what I go explore and find out that's easy. That's so easy for me to avoid anything that truly, you know, gives me that feeling where it's like, oof, I liked this once upon a time or, Oh, I, I kind of like it right now, but let me just find something else that works. That isn't, you know, jacking off in front of yep. people. I mean, I think, I think, look like this is, this is not a solved problem. Right. And this is, it's like the, the definition of a gray area. Sometimes it's, it's, it's black and white. It's real clear. Sometimes it's in the middle part. And sometimes it's like, yeah, it's shitty, but I still think there's something there. And so I think if I did want to recommend something from Louis C.K. to people for some reason, I would say, yeah, go watch the one episode of Louis called So Did the Fat Lady that was the one with Sarah Baker basically giving a monologue that lasts for a lot of the episode that – where Louis is a secondary character. It's not about him. It's about him going and making a space for a voice that was not his to do that thing that makes comedy important and good, which is to speak truth in no uncertain terms and force people to wait it out and be uncomfortable. I think that, I think that holds up. I think it, the reason it holds up is because aside from the name that's on the top of the show, it's not about this person. And I think you can say this, there, there can be pieces of art that do something important, even if the artist is a monster. We recognize that they're a monster and we apply that metric to all of their work. And if there's something that shines through there and that we can put it in a context and say, this is good and this is important, you probably should see it at some point in your life and then you should go find new stuff to look at and spend your money finding good things and voices that deserve just to make a paycheck and make a living so they can keep doing it and we can have a big, wide, weird world of people saying, all different types of people saying all the different types of things and people can appreciate what they like and not be beholden to what some big media corporation decides to put in front of you. It's a start to this problem. <laughs> it's like, it's just, I've been thinking about this thing for no joke, two years, and that's as far as I've gotten. But I think, uh, I think it's a start. You guys should go watch that one episode of Louie and absolutely no other episodes of the show. <laughs> I like your strategy of getting someone to watch an episode of Louie that has the least amount of Louie. It's just like the only way it's yeah. going to work. I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, the, I've gone back and watched episodes and there are funny moments and there are things that I appreciate. Uh, but when I'm honest with myself and I can think of situations where this might not be the case, if I'm honest with myself, knowing what I know about him and knowing that these things were happening as this show was being written and made, um, have ruined a lot of it. And the things that I like are mostly not him. I love Pamela Adlon. I love Sarah Baker. I love um, a lot of the people in his world where, to be sure, he was the gatekeeper, but where they got a platform to to start there and to do their own thing. Um, yeah, go appreciate that bits of it. And um, mm. yeah, he's got a good stand-up special in there or two, but I don't know. Go listen to the song Dream Girl by The Lonely Island, which is where the trio raps about their dream girl who turns out to be uh, a very insane, kooky character. And then the song devolves into an advertisement for Chex Mix. I think it's great. 
and not problematic. Dan, do you want to endorse um, football? <laughs> uh, what's the best team? What's the least problematic NFL uh, team? The Vikings actually have hired a lot of women executives, which is pretty cool. Uh, but then go. they also like kept their special teams coordinator who said uh, that he hoped like gay people would be nuked. Like not even not even an exaggeration. Oh, like just. Yeah. So what about I don't the, know. Um, what about the Eagles? They're all right. Um, yeah. I mean, they uh, they supported freeing Meek Mill. That's fine. Um, <laughs> <Free> Meek Mill. <laughs> Who I support as a musician, despite the concept of some of his songs. Go watch, go watch this clip on ESPN of uh, a basketball player throwing a ball at a fan because he said something about his mom. That's my recommendation. <laughs> go Damn. watch that video. <laughs> yeah, Patrick Beverly. He throws a ball at a guy who he said said something about his mom. So I'm I'm in support of that because. Uh, because assholes who pay a bunch of money for uh, front row uh, seats at sporting events don't get to say whatever they want. If uh, James Harden turns out to be a monster, could you guys not tell me? Because like my main interaction yeah. with sports <laughs> these days is just like watching him style on people in gifts, and <laughs> this is all I've got in the sports world, guys. It's all I've got. Please, please. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> all right. Yeah. No. We'll just we'll protect you from that i i truly i was gonna see if this came up but i truly it's like wow ignorance is bliss really is just don't know about it it's not it's not because it also (laughs) means that you are bankrolling monsters and i guess (laughs) i want to know but i don't it it implies it applies it implies uh, applies solely to the person who is blissfully unaware and nothing else just their own mood and otherwise, it is still destructive. What a world! What a world! It's a crazy mixed up world. But world. those are some good, uh, some good techniques, Burks, Birds, and like you said, please call me Burks. And you, <laughs> Burks, Mister Burks. Um, it is complicated. It is like there's no hard and fast answer. You just have to feel it out and decide. You know, I think if sometimes you just think about it enough and go like, yeah, I'm just going to stop because <laughs> me trying to argue for it is only going to be uh, exhausting and make me feel like I'm I shouldn't be arguing for it. But there is there is a conversation to be had about every every single thing and uh, keep finding the good stuff because there's a lot of good stuff out there that isn't being bad. That's that's the uh, uh, gaming in hell hot take. There's a lot of good stuff not being bad. <laughs> yep. It sure is something, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes stuff is bad, and it do be like that, though. It right. They don't think it be like it is, but it do. Yeah, I don't. I don't. This has I don't been keep up with another memes. episode yeah, of Getting It Out. It's always how the show ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we it's just sort of peter out, <laughs> devolve into uh, <laughs> muttering, incomprehensible. Uh, uh, bed to bed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let's do let's do plugs, and then we'll talk about Patreon, and then we can officially end it. Then. Yeah, and then each of us will do our Cosby impression. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, don't do that. Bird. Stop. <laughs> yeah, there's like four layers of problematic there. Uh, all right. Hi, my name is uh, Famous Birds. Uh, it's not my real name, but I'm not going to tell you my real name. Um, you should follow me on twittercom Famous Birds. You should listen to Crucible Radio. You should uh, go to patreoncom Crucible Radio and listen to the bonus pod, which is uh, us talking about. Not so much video game stuff, and there's some good stuff there, and it it helps make this this whole shebang a thing. Uh, also, if you are insane and you want your brain to explode from reading Twitter too much, you should follow me on twittercom slash birds underscore 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 underscore. It's birds five underscores. Uh, it's a good account to follow. It is pretty good. You, you do a good job on Twitter once you got uh, away from the desk. Well, I mean, you, you want to know, it's like I'm I've, I'm trying to find the next name for my third one because I now need an escape from this account. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a whole constellation of birds accounts uh, that allow me to temporarily extend. Yeah, that's sanity. what happens is you, you, you make a video game one and then you realize you hate it. So you just start following all of those comedians you followed a second mm-hmm. time. And then you realize like, okay, this is now just my old Twitter. Yep. Twitter's so good. Uh, cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Birds. Thanks for having me.
Of course. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Uh, if if you would like to support us, the show, uh, check out patreon.com slash gaming in hell. Uh, we've got our nifty stickers now. They look good. Uh, they look really cool. I've got one on my computer case right now. Uh, just sitting there and, uh, yeah, all, uh, all patrons get a free sticker, uh, and we'll probably do some other, other cool, uh, things for patrons later, but for now stickers are what we got. Uh, Dan, do I get a sticker? Yeah, of course. I'll, I'm going to okay. bring, I'm going to bring the stack with me because oh, I need right. to give one to your mom too. Cause she is a patron. Oh yeah. Yeah. She is a patron. So, uh, I will, I will hand deliver your mom's sticker. Um, that's perfect. Awesome. Dan will not hand deliver all of you stickers. That's true. It's just not feasible. That's true. Uh, if you're a patron, mom, you're a special yeah, person. If, if you're a patron, <laughs> uh, and you send me your address for a sticker, do not expect to see me show up with that sticker. Uh, I will just send it in the mail. Dan will come to your house wearing a Minnesota Vikings jersey. <laughs> Freshly purchased to support my favorite organizations in the world. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye, nerds. Yeah. Bye. Music this week from Daydreamer. It is very good. Listen at daydreamer.bandcamp.com. You can send email to Crucible Radio at gmail.com It's getting dark and I thought they'd be here by now But they're not so I guess I should try to find them somehow I'll keep quiet I'll stay light on my Hello everyone, Swain here. You know that Crucible Radio is your source for all things Destiny PvP, and I know you want more than just this video, so make sure to head on over to crucibleradio.com to find all of our past episodes, detailed Crucible maps, t-shirts, and much, much more.